Hi everyone. Thank you, Helly. My props. Um, yeah, my name's Anna. It's great to see you. It's great. I feel like every week there's new faces. There's new people in the room. So hi if you are new. If you're um, visiting first time or you're making this your home, it's great. It's great to have you with us. I hope you feel at home. And there's an opportunity tonight to spend more time together, chat, get to know each other. So do stick around because it'd be great. Great to spend time with you. I, I'm excited about this message tonight. <laughs> I do feel fired up, um, and my prayer is that you too, um, as God speaks to you this evening, in, I pray that in faith, will fire you up um, as well. Just that little bit more, burning heart, a little bit more. Um, we are journeying through Acts. We're going through a series in Acts, um, if you've been with us. So far, I think we've uh, had one week, haven't we, on decisions? We looked at Pentecost, then we looked at decisions last week. We're looking at the early church the, um, in the book of Acts. It's a great book. Um, and looking at some of the things that they faced um, as new Christians and what that means for us today as we face those same challenges, what we can learn from them and what we can kind of implement into our own lives. So if you've got a Bible with you, grab it. Um, we are going to be jumping around a little bit. I'm going to go through a few examples. So you've got to stay awake. You've got to work out where we are. Um, and I'm particularly excited about this message because it's... Um, it's something that's close to my heart um, and the work that I do. Oh, gosh, <laughs> that took me. <laughs> um, I see a lot firsthand um, about this topic. And so I'm coming from a place tonight where actually as I, as I work and as I hear from Christians around the world, um, and I'll tell you a bit more about what I do in a minute, um, I've learned more, more of faith, more in my prayer life. I've been deepened in those senses than ever before. And so there's, we can gain so much from looking at the early church, at Christians that face opposition and hostility. Ooh, that's the title. Sounds easy, doesn't it? Happy. Woo. <laughs> opposition and hostility. So um, the book of Acts, it's an exciting book. If you've never read it before, go and read it. It's wild. It could be a movie. Um, we see the Holy Spirit fall at Pentecost. We see miracles. We see growth of the church. We see conversions. But the strongest theme in the book is persecution. And like I said, this is a topic that's close to my heart. I work for a charity called um, Open Doors, not to be confused with Open Door in Cheltenham. I've had that conversation many times. <laughs> Open doors, and we support and strengthen Christians that face persecution around the world. You may um, be interested to know that there are over 365 million Christians in our world today that face um, forms of persecution, discrimination for their faith. That's one in seven Christians globally. It's quite a big um, stat, isn't it? And um, there's a map that's coming up. Oh, you maybe you already had it. You can see there the global picture of some of the hardest places in the world to be a Christian. Um, it's the most, like I said, amazing ministry to be part of. It's honestly the biggest privilege um, that I get to do what I do and learn from these Christians facing all kinds of opposition. It's, it's really inspiring. It's very humbling. Um, and so as we look at the early church tonight, I'm also going to share some insights from the persecuted church. I say persecuted church. I don't really love that term because we're one church and part of it faces persecution and suffers but when one part suffers we all suffer don't we so we are one church but I'm going to share some stories um, as well to help us learn what does it look like to face opposition hostility and how how do we go about responding to that so Acts to give a short overview by way of context and persecution in the early chapters like I said we look at Pentecost Holy Spirit falls and floods the room there's Growth in Jerusalem, I'm going to do this quickly, um, but it's not long before the lead apostles face um, a flogging. After that, Stephen gets stoned to death, we'll look at him later. Um, after that, Paul starts persecuting. Peter gets jailed, the church gets scattered, and there's a great persecution. As a result of this spreading, the church continue to preach and spread the gospel, and it gets shared with the Gentiles. It's all because of the persecution that it's spread. It's almost like the engine of the gospel. So Antioch, 
takes over as the main sending church from Jerusalem. Paul the persecutor becomes the Paul the persecuted. Um, he gets a stoning in a place called Lystra. He's attacked by a mob. He's jailed in Philippi. He's abused in Berea. He's nearly killed by a mob in Ephesus. He narrowly escapes a lynching in Jerusalem. He spends the last third of the book as a prisoner surviving an assassination plot. Arriving in Rome under house arrest, and that's where the book kind of peaks with Paul still under arrest. It's quite a lot, isn't it? <laughs> that is persecution. And, and why is this? Well, I don't really know, but what I do know is that we see God using persecution for the ad- advancement of the gospel. Quick word on opposition and hostility here, how we define it. I think it will come up on the screen. Opposition being this act of opposing, rest, um, resisting, combating the, the idea that something stands against something else or is in the way of something. Hostility is the state or quality of being um, friendly, antagonistic, unkind, opposed, um, feelings of anger, all that kind of thing. I'll use the terms interchangeably, also um, persecution as well. So, but that's what we're talking about tonight, okay? Um, there's two kind of key realities that I just kind of wanted to lay out as foundations to begin with, as a starting place from where we go. Um, number one being, as Christians, we should expect opposition. Jesus promises it. He says to his disciples, you will have trouble in this world. You will face persecution because of me. The world has, in some ways, always rejected the Christian faith. We see that throughout time. The truth is, the Christian faith is a value system that is at odds with the world. Opposition is the recognition of this kind of radical counterculturalism of Christianity. It's a given. We should expect it. Number two, we're in a spiritual battle. I know we talk about that a lot here at Trinity. Battles and blessings. We are in a spiritual battle. There is an enemy, and he does stand opposed to the kingdom of God. But he's already won. (laughs) We're on the winning team. That's already been established. We've been singing. We've been praising that truth, haven't we? So I'm not going to spend tonight talking about this, but... Um, we should be aware that there is a spiritual battle, there is spiritual warfare, and there is opposition. And we will face that as we pursue God, okay? Quick example of that. Jamie, my husband, recently went to Macedonia with some of the team. Kev, I see you, Luke and David, Judy, don't know who's around. Um, he went, you went to Macedonia like last month, wasn't it? The week before he was about to go, everything went wrong. (laughs) So many things went wrong. We had car problems, we had health problems, we were arguing a lot. It was just like, what is going on? I think I even said, this week sucks. And we suddenly clocked, ah, you're going away next week to spread the gospel. You're going to be preaching, you're going to be worshipping, you're going to be praying for healing. Maybe this is a bit of opposition. So that can happen as we're pursuing the things of God, as we're stepping out in faith. There can be opposition. So, two truths at the outset, okay? Let's take a look at Acts. Um, Actually, before that, let me talk about this. Like I said, there are millions of Christians around the world that face extreme levels of persecution. Here in the UK, we might not face that same kind of level of persecution, okay? And I don't want to underplay that at all you might actually be sitting here tonight with genuine examples real examples lived examples of um, persecution you might have come from all sorts of places we don't know we all carry that so I don't want to undermine that or underplay that I'm not saying that we don't face it but in general terms here in the UK we don't experience the kind of severe extreme forms of persecution that some Christians do we have a lot of freedom don't we I think we face different forms of opposition. One day we may face extreme. Some of you may move to places that do, in fact. Some of us will have had experiences of um, discrimination or limitations to your practice of faith, perhaps at um, work or in institutional places or in family, for example. So I'm not denying the potential um, of that, but we're not likely to be imprisoned or abducted or killed for our faith. We have a high level of freedom. We're not expecting anyone to come in tonight and shut us down. But what I do believe is that we, we live in a culture where opposition and hostility does exist as Christians. Perhaps maybe guys behind um, 
supposedly normal, everyday realities. You know, I'm thinking about social media, individualism, um, celebrity, influence culture, idols of all sorts. On a scale of persecution, it might not be up there with like dictatorship and killing or whatever, but it might be more subtle than that and disguised. It's opposition, though, nonetheless, to Jesus. I don't know if you remember, um, a little while ago, um, a guy called Simon Gilbo came and spoke here, and he, he used this concept of a satanic lullaby of our age and our culture. And it's really stuck with me, that kind of subtle, sleepy lulling in our culture that it, that's in opposition to the ways of God, and that we can be, um, I guess, tempted and dragged into. These are things that are in opposition to the kingdom of God, aren't they? Temptation, like I said, is a form of strategy to distance us from God. Hostile cultures that can resist, that can weaken, that can stand in the way of us living out our faith. So if that is what we face, if that's kind of a picture of maybe the context that we're in of the UK, and we know that persecution in the book of Acts is a central component to the life of the early church, to the disciples to the ultimate spread of the gospel, then let's look at what we can learn from their responses to it and therefore how we can respond today, okay? So, like I said, we're going to be in Acts. We're going to be jumping around. I'm going to summarize. The, word, the scripture will be on the screen, so follow along, but I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to summarize, if that's okay. I'm slightly different this week. But we're going to start in um, Acts 4 with Peter and John, okay? So maybe turn there. Peter and John, they um, are two apostles who were part of Jesus' 12 disciples. They just prayed and seen a lame man healed. They were proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus and they were speaking to the people that had gathered who had witnessed this healing. The priests, the temple guards, the um, Sadducees, who were a sect of the Jews, um, they were disturbed by their teaching, so they arrested them. Yet still, their teaching touched many people and brought 5,000 people to Christ. I want to see that in our town, no? Let's pray for healing. See, 5,000 people come to Christ. The next day, Peter and John, they were brought brought before the Sanhedrin, um, which was the Jewish council. They were questioned about what power and by what name they had healed this man. Peter, it says, filled with the Holy Spirit, boldly declared that Jesus had healed him, the very person that they, the Jewish council, were responsible for crucifying, but then he raised from the dead. It says the Sanhedrin were amazed by their courage, noting, I love this, that they were uneducated, ordinary men, but that they had been with Jesus. So unable to deny this miracle, they they conferred about how they could stop the apostles from spreading this message. They warned them to not preach, to not cheat, teach to not share any news about who this Jesus was they replied saying no we can't not but speak about Jesus so after further kind of threats they were released Peter and John um, returned to the other believers they reported back everyone raised their voices in prayer asking God for greater boldness to continue the work despite the threats the Holy Spirit fell and they shook the room that they were in. So they kept preaching, they kept going, they kept teaching and sharing all that they had. So we see um, this miracle of healing and then the subsequent opposition they face. They're seized, they're held in jail, they're questioned, they're threatened and they're warned not to continue sharing this message. But what's their response? What's their response to this hostility, to this opposition? Firstly, we see boldness, don't we? utter boldness, the way they state with confidence who it is that is doing this healing work. They say, it's Jesus. They say, um, they even point the finger, they say, this is the guy that you crucified because he claimed he was the son of man. Well, it's him. He's healing. He's still moving in power. They dare to speak his name and to claim that it was by his power the man was healed. Despite the threats of what um, might happen to them if they continue, they say with confidence, we're going to still keep talking about this man, Jesus. They even share the gospel. They were so bold. Think about how like, intimidating, how scary that would have been. Like I said, they knew that the potential was that they could be crucified like Jesus, right? 
It's the same people, yet they, de they decide that we're going to be bold, we're going to share. These are high status, powerful people at the time, but they stand firm and they dare to share. They make the most of the opportunity. And that's the thing about opposition. We see it here in Acts. We might fear it, we could crumble under it, but here we see it as an opportunity. 5,000 people came to Christ. They came to believe, having witnessed the healing. They were accused, they were questioned, and they shared the gospel. They, they dared to say that Jesus was worth everything, no matter what you do to me. We also see the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And I sense that happening in the room tonight in worship. I sense the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in the atmosphere. I don't know if you did. We're going to pray for that tonight. It says, Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, declared that Jesus had healed the man. In the face of opposition, the Holy Spirit empowers us, empowers us to stand firm, to be strong, to speak the name of Jesus, and to step out in boldness when there's opportunity. I, part of my testimony was... Um, or oh, is this life-defining empowerment of the Holy Spirit moment? Um, it might not seem a big deal to many, but for me, it was, it was life-changing. I was at school um, here in Cheltenham, and uh, the, it was in my maths class. There are a few um, guys, I dare to say it, who, for whatever reason, they just liked to mock me a little bit. <laughs> Sounds so sad. But they knew I was a Christian, and they liked to ridicule and mock me a little bit. And I used to dread my maths classes, because I just thought, oh, what are they going to say? What are they going to do? And there was this one particular day where they... Um, I don't know what they were talking about, but they basically, they had the attention of the whole room and they were like, Anna, you're a Christian, aren't you? And it was like everyone was looking at me. There was, time kind of stood still. And um, it was this moment where I was like, oh, which way am I going to go? You know, I have two choices here. Either I deny it and I um, shy away, I blend into the background, or I say, oh, this is who I am. This is who I am. And the empowerment of the Holy Spirit came because um, this scripture came to my mind in this moment. The scripture, word for word, crystal clear, which I don't think I'd ever read before, came into my mind. Um, and I'll read it to you. It's Matthew 10, 32. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. I was maybe like 13. I can't remember how old I was. But this scripture came and I just knew, I just knew I couldn't not. But I was filled with courage. I was filled with courage. And I was just like, yeah, I am. And yeah, they laughed. There were some giggles. I'm sure people spoke about me behind my back. But it was a life-defining moment where the Holy Spirit, I was just so aware of it, filled me, gave me that scripture, and, and filled me with that courage, that boldness to be like, yeah, and what? <laughs> I'm a Christian. <laughs> so... Um, there's a couple of responses to opposition and hostility, isn't there? Boldness, empowerment of spirit. Let's look at another. Acts chapter 6. Jump ahead a little bit. We have um, a man named Stephen. He was chosen by these apostles as a new disciple to go out and to um, continue spreading the gospel. They were getting so big. They were needing to go so far. They had to recruit others. It says he was full of grace and power. He performed great wonders and signs among the people. Don't you want to be known for that? Um, so he was going about doing his thing. Opposition arose as members of the synagogue started arguing with him. They secretly instigated um, these men together to accuse him of blaspheming against God. He was seized. He was brought before the Sanhedrin. False witnesses testified that he had spoken sentence-worthy things. Yet throughout this accusation, it says, um, Stephen's face appeared like that of an angel. When given the opportunity to speak, Stephen launched into this whole speech recounting Israel's history. Go, go back and read it later tonight. It's, it's pretty mega. And he then accuses the Sanhedrin of resisting the Holy Spirit, of betraying, of murdering Jesus and of failing to keep the law. He's so bold. That doesn't go down too well. Um, and the Sanhedrin, enraged by his speech, it says they gnashed their teeth at him. Hostile environment. Um, but again, Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and he had this vision of God. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. So he, he declared this vision, provoking them even further, and they dragged him out of the city and stoned him to death. 
crazy stuff. Witnesses to this um, laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul, who later becomes Paul. So um, it says he approved of this stoning. After he was stoned, um, or as he was being stoned, sorry, Stephen, um, he prayed to Jesus. He prayed. He prayed for God to receive his spirit, and he asked to forgive his ex- executioners. Then um, he died. And it says on that day that huge persecution broke out as a result, scattering the apostles to different places. So another example of opposition that the early church faced. What was the response? We see again, don't we, boldness. Boldness to proclaim the word of God. Stephen goes back through history to challenge the Sanhedrin about their own faith. He tailors the message specifically to them and he witnesses to Jesus in the middle, in the face of all this false accusation, which um, was clearly with irate people, right? They weren't pleasant. He was determined to obey God rather than man. So much so that he faces a stoning as a result. He shows faithfulness in witness. Faithfulness to witness. What a powerful testimony, bang in the middle of all of this opposition going on. He takes the moment to present the gospel in a way that is relevant to them, right? He knows he's going to face physical harm. It's already rallying up, yet he still chooses to declare the gospel with boldness. He's faithful to the very end. It's amazing too how he has this vision, isn't it, of Jesus. He's about, um, as he's about to die, he's faithful as well in praying and forgiving his accusers. He's literally about to die at their hands, falsely, unjust, yet he chooses to forgive. Like it's, it's pretty, like wow, it's bold. It's, he's faithful in witness and prayer. This reminds me of a lady that um, I know at Open Doors called Mary. Sadly, she actually has recently just died of unrelated health issues. But um, here she is, amazing woman. When she was 20 years old, she's from a, a village in northern Nigeria. When she was 20 years old, um, militants attacked their church during a Sunday service. Um, shooting, they were killing. Um, everyone ran, everyone dispersed from the church. She was running away, running for her life. She had a sister calling her name. And she had a choice. Do I save myself or do I run back um, and get my sister? She ran back. Militants um, stopped her. And she, again, had another choice. Either you come with us or we kill you. Um, so she went with them and three other women. They were held in a camp for 54 days. Um, during that time, they were forced to cook for their captors. Um, they faced sexual abuse. They were um, essentially slaves to them. But despite her situation, she said this. She could feel God's presence with her. I don't know where it came from, she said. God gave me this strength and this boldness. The strength of Mary's faith and her faithfulness to pray in the midst of just the most atrocious opposition led her to share the gospel with some of her captors. She asked them questions about what they were doing, if they knew what they were doing, if they knew that it was evil. Did they know that there was a better way with Jesus? They said that they knew it was wrong, but they didn't know how to stop. So she she told them, you just need to give your life to Jesus and he will forgive you. Crazy boldness in the middle of, you know, just the worst circumstances. You can't even really imagine it. But faithful in praying, faithful in witnessing with boldness, despite what the outcome might be. So Peter and John, Stephen, Mary, they were bold. They were faithful in prayer, in witness, and in testifying about Jesus. Let's look at one more example. Acts 16 this time, starting at verse 16. So we see Paul, who was, like I said, the persecutor mentioned in the last example we read, approving of Stephen's stoning. Now he's become the persecuted after he had a miraculous conversion with God. So he and Silas, they are entering a a town called Philippi in Macedonia. Um, They are followed by a slave girl who has a demon and very human, Paul gets annoyed by her, it says, Um, and he commands in the name of Jesus for this spirit to leave her, and it does. This annoys her owners who have lost their source of income, so they drag Paul and Silas into the marketplace before the Sanhedrin. Um, They are beaten, they are thrown into prison with feet fastened in stocks. At midnight, in their prison cell, Paul and Silas pray. They praise and they sing hymns. 
An earthquake then shakes the prison, opening the doors, loosening the chains. The most wild miracle, right? The jailer, thinking the prisoners have escaped, he's about to kill himself, um, but Paul stops him. The jailer asks what he must do. Having witnessed this, he asks them what he must do to be saved. So they tell him about Jesus. They pray for him. And he and his whole household are baptized. They wash their wounds, they feed them, and they all rejoice in their newfound faith. Um, The magistrate then sends orders for Paul and Silas to be released. Paul, the audacity, insists that the magistrates come themselves to release them because they have been wronged. Um, So they apologize and they personally escort them, um, asking them to leave the city. Again, the most amazing story, like severe persecution and opposition, but the most amazing story. What do we learn about their response to this opposition? Again, we see boldness. We see faithfulness in witness and prayer. We also see, as Jay was just praying, joy in the midst of what we're facing. Joy in the midst of opposition, in the midst of hostility. I can imagine some very real responses to that situation would have been anger, confusion, um, loss of hope, fear, probably. Yet they trust the Lord, don't they? They say, we don't know what's going on, but we're going to pray. We're going to worship. We're going to rejoice and praise in our cell. And then the miraculous happens. The power of God breaks in as a result of their worship. And that's what God does. He gives us power to maintain God-given joy, God-given hope, God-given faith in the midst or in the face of adversity. And it has a ramification on the jailer too, doesn't it? He witnesses a different way of being. I'm sure he witnessed their different attitude and their different um, response to this situation. They've been uh, imprisoned unjustly. And yet he sees them worshipping. You must be thinking, what on earth? And this reminds me of another three women who are incredible. Um, Rebecca, Etty, and Ratna from um, Indonesia. Just amazing women. They live in one of the largest Muslim um, countries on earth. Rebecca, who's in the middle there, is a doxa. um, And she, alongside this, ran a church for about 30 people in her village. So uh, best friends, they journey um, from their village to their church. And every time they did, they witnessed or they saw these street children uh, on the street, children of prostitutes, of homeless um, families. And they had this idea, why don't we start this uh, thing called a Happy Tuesday Club, which was basically just providing a a warm meal once a week, a good home-cooked meal once a week, and some health education. And they they also asked the parents if it would be okay to share stories of Jesus. So they basically started this Sunday school once a week. This went on for months and months um, until some local fundamentalists became outraged that Christianity was becoming too visible, basically. So they were arrested. They had a a show trial where 500 hate-filled, screaming radicals were at the back of the court. um, And they were sentenced for five years for the Christianization of children. So um, they were taken to this prison where there were 400 male prisoners, nine women, 48-degree heat. Just horrendous. Um, They were put in this prison block where there were nine other um, inmates, some jihadists, some um, drug dealers, one woman who would kill for $10. Just crazy stuff. The prison officers would have to be fully armed to to go in and to enter this cell. It was so dysfunctional. There was excrement, urine on the wall. They were locked away for 15 hours a day. In the first 24 hours, Rebecca heard God speak to her. And she asked the jailer for a bucket of water and some disinfectant. And the three of them got to work washing out um, the other women's cells to make it just that little bit more habitable. They um, cooked. They started to cook for their inmates who didn't know how to feed themselves. If they didn't have, if the women didn't have enough food, they would share their rations with them. The environment and the culture gradually started to change. Instead of viewing, for them, instead of viewing this time as punishment, they viewed it as a privilege and a joy to be there, (laughs) like crazy. And soon, um, news started spreading throughout the prison. After a few weeks, um, a prison guard came to Rebecca 
saying, could, could she help him because he had stomach pains? Could she advise some medicine? <laughs> so she did. Although she'd lost her accreditation um, as a criminal, she, she did. She advised them. A week or a few weeks later, 40 guards were receiving medical help from her. <laughs> um, after that, the prison governor himself invited them into his office. And um, he said, I quote this, I was informed you were subversives. And so I was going to break your heart and mind the moment you came in here. But you have been a blessing to the entire prison. And he actually invited them to have their church of 30 people in the prison where they could be kept safe and where they would continue to be a blessing to the prison. How amazing is that? For two and a half years, those women just really practically served their community and loved their new community. They, they helped, they, and they shared the love of Jesus day in, day out. Amazingly, they were set free two and a half years earlier. What did they do the week after they got released? They went back to the prison to disciple the 47 people that become a Christian during their time. Just amazing. Isn't that such a joy, a picture of joy in the middle of opposition? I'm sure it wasn't easy. I'm sure it was horrible. They left their families, they had children, but they knew the love of Christ. They weren't deterred by the hostility, just like Paul and Silas in their prison. They knew what they carried. And as I've been praying about this message tonight, I was drawn to um, another short parable in Matthew's gospel. So I'm just going to uh, read that quickly. Matthew 13, 45 to 46, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for fine pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away and sold everything he had and bought it. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven, which, remember, is in opposition to the world. And I think... Um, when it comes to opposition, when it comes to persecution, often we're so quick to focus on the cost, on the price paid as a result of the pain of the suffering of what we lose out on as a result. And you know, that is very real. The pain is great. It is very difficult for many of us, and maybe you can relate to that tonight. I'm not saying it isn't, and we absolutely need spaces in our, in our church and in this church to grieve and to lament and to join alongside each other in the midst of that. So if that's you, know that there is that space here in this church. But sometimes I think we can become so focused on the cost that we forget about the price, the value of what we have in Jesus, the value of the kingdom of heaven, of what we carry, of what is gained in knowing him, in receiving his love, in having forgiveness, of, of having a life on offer that is to the full and that is free in Jesus. And we see that. I see that in these examples of opposition in the early church. They endured, didn't they? And they continued the mission despite the cost because of the value that they were so aware of in Jesus. They, they said it was worth it, no matter what happened. Mary, Rebecca, Etty, right now, I could tell you so many more Christians today that are choosing, despite the cost, to, to endure and to, and to go through it because they know the greater value. Helly last week showcased her God-given pink wedges. I'm going to show you some of my shoes. <laughs> God's clearly speaking through shoes, and I'm here for it. Um, but I wanted to show you an illustration. These are my wedding shoes. I got married last year and I sensed God um, tell me to adorn myself in pearls. <laughs> Maybe it's because I'm from Cheltenham, I don't know. Um, but here they are. Look at them. Aren't they beautiful? And let me tell you, they cost a lot. So um, I'm glad they're getting used in a different way. <laughs> um, but do you know the value that you carry? Do you know that as we go, as we walk, as we journey this, um, this life with God, s trying to see, praying, seeking heaven on earth, walking through opposition and hostility, standing in front of choices to make decisions. We walk with a different kind of value. The pearl of great price. Yes, there's a cost. We know there's a cost. But there's also such a great value. Well, that balance. Oh, nice. Um, we know there's a value. 
And I really, I really felt God say that tonight. Do we know the value? Do we need reminding of the value? Turning our eyes from the cost to the greater value. And don't get me wrong, that's hard. I'm not undermining the difficulties in this. But like we've been learning, it's the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. It's all these things. So from, from these responses to opposition, what are the lessons for us here today? Let me just summarize all of that once again. Number one, we need to recognize that there is opposition. We can't escape it. Like I said, it's a given. We're in a spiritual battle, and the kingdom of God is a direct challenge to the way of the world. But be encouraged by that. Be encouraged that we are all going to face opposition, that we are in this together. Your story is unique, but it, it has similarities with the person sat next to you because because we're carrying that together, aren't we? We need to be alert to it as well. We need to recognize that there is opposition. We need to be alert to the ways, especially in our culture, that might be more subtle, that might be more disguised, that there is opposition. I feel like tonight there might be some, maybe God's going to do that, make us alert. What are the ways in which actually we're facing opposition and we need to step into those places. Number two, being faithful in prayer and witness. We learn from this early church and the persecuted church to be faithful in prayer. We need to pray in the face of opposition. Remember Peter, Stephen, Paul and Silas, they prayed and they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. They prayed for boldness, didn't they? to keep on going. They prayed and they worshipped in the middle of opposition. God is never going to leave us on our own. He's never going to leave us. He's there and he's there to enact the kingdom through opposition. That was the story of Acts. Persecution spread the gospel. So again, take encouragement from that. Take courage from that. If you're walking through opposition of some kind, which we all are, but I know that some people in the room will be really facing it at the moment. You know you're sat there and you're thinking, yes, I'm in that right now. Be encouraged. The Holy Spirit wants to refill you. He wants to refresh you and empower you. Faithfulness in witness too. Let your, let's be defiant with truth. <laughs> and count the cost, yes, but be aware of the value and the and the reality that we have a story to tell we have a testimony for the world to know we can witness and be faithful in witnessing in the midst of opposition three responding with grace and boldness standing firm in our faith being bold being courageous we can learn and see again what can happen as a result of it can't we having read these examples i think for us let's not compromise there's a temptation, isn't there, when we're opposed to shy away, to um, let fear get a foothold, to water down perhaps the truth that we have to make it more palatable to those that are opposing perhaps. Let's be confident in the truth that we have, knowing the value that we carry. God will show us the best way to respond, having been filled with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, it might be a, a speech like Stephen's or um, praising and worshipping, cleaning up cells, something very practical. God will, through the Holy Spirit empowerment, he will show us how to do that, how to be bold. Four, and finally, turning hostility into opportunity. Let's see trials, let's see opposition as an opportunity for witnessing for some of you, and I, I sense this this week, actually your place of opposition right now is with family and with, with friends. Um, and that's hard. <laughs> that is hard. I won't, I'm not undermining that. But the word here is opportunity. God wants to use you in those places and spaces to be faithful in praying, faithful in witnessing, bold in, in what you're doing, but opportunity. And if you need refreshing, that's here for you tonight. And then finally, let's not forget the transformative power of the gospel. Everything we've read in Acts tonight is like, wow, isn't it? I don't know about you, I read it and I'm like, I want to see that here today. God is able to do more than we could even imagine. Let's not take opposition and hostility into our own hands where we try to control it. You can try, but 
you'll, you'll burn out. We need God to do his thing and to work through us, to empower us by his spirit. So I hope you hear this and you feel encouraged. I think, let's, I don't know, when you think about opposition and hostility, you think, oh, you might, it's a lot. But let's be encouraged of the value that we have, value in the gospel, of remaining steadfast in opposition, being faithful, being bold, a deeper commitment to prayer and to reliance on the Holy Spirit, and perhaps a challenge to see opportunity, to use hostility for opportunity.